My name is David Giard. I am the host of the mildly popular television show, online television show, Technology and Friends. You can find that at technologyandfriends.com. And for the first time ever, I'm actually doing a, a, an interview on at a conference virtually this way. And my guest today is my old friend, Russ Festino. Russ, how are you today? No, I'm doing great. Uh, thanks for having me, Dave. Uh, just oh, a little bit about myself you. to all the folks. I'm a Please. developer advocate for Algorand and uh, been there almost three years now. Uh, learned about a very exciting technology along the way called blockchain, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. I can't wait to share my experiences uh, with everybody on that. And uh, gee, Dave, it's good to see you again, man. We did a lot together um, I'm back with the Microsoft MVP program, and now yep. you are actually at Microsoft, which is great. That's I'm really cool. It. So congratulations. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, blockchain, we're here to talk about blockchain, and blockchain is one of those technologies, I think, that everybody's heard of but few people know about. Uh, what What is blockchain? All right, we'll go ahead and do that. And for the people that are on board here and live in the uh, session here today, if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead to the uh, question tab and uh, go ahead and uh, ask your questions there. I'll keep an eye on that during the session as well. Okay, Dave? And uh, okay. let's go ahead then and continue on with our session here today. And, you know, the first question you just asked is what is yeah. blockchain? What is right? it and so why do I care about it? Yeah, that's even a more important question, right? So... Uh, blockchain itself is a very simple thing. It's a, actually a distributed ledger that records transactions. And by distributed, I mean everybody can have a copy of it. It's not a centralized database. Uh, mm -hmm. When you create what, uh, something that's called a node, basically you are just downloading a copy of the ledger that you have accessible to you. And once the important thing is once the, the transactions are recorded, they're immutable which is really nice because it's basically a read-only ledger mm -hmm. right once when you have a bunch of new transactions that are going to be written to the blockchain. And the fact that it's immutable uh, provides you an audit trail, a very clean audit trail. And um, I was in a, a session one time. I was delivered to, uh, I think, a woman who code, and uh, there was a, an attendee there. Brenda, I think you maybe know her from Microsoft, uh, Sable. But uh, she, she now is a cybersecurity expert, and she was saying, you know, not only is it immutable, but it's very secure because of that. And so uh, she would say, uh, you know how you have two-factor authentication um, you know, you have a backup uh, primary authentication, a backup. Well, yeah, think of that is, uh, the, yeah, think of that authentication is like that times the number of blocks in the blockchain before you go, because it's so, it, it's, it's very difficult to uh, tamper with, if not mm -hmm. impossible to tamper with a blockchain uh, data that's recorded prior. So very, very secure. And, um, the other thing on, on blockchains is the consensus, which is a term that's used for how are the blocks approved or written to the blockchain. What um, is a block? A, a block is basically a, 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 a time period, let's say five seconds. And within five seconds, there are uh, transactions that are associated with a block. So that is really it. That the, the you know the 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 block is actually just a time a time frame of when transactions occurred. Okay. All right. And so you know what we want to do is is have something that's fast, secure, and scalable in the way of the consensus approval process, and something that's you know has some certainty and, and very low cost. And these are all ideal scenarios. Uh, there are many blockchains out there. Um, Algorand has one, uh, as well as uh, you know you probably have heard of Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, a couple others. But there's used probably over two thousand uh, you know blockchains that are out there. Just to kind of give you a feel for the different types and characteristics of these uh like bitcoin and ethereum basically is a proof of work they call it uh that involves expensive machinery that uh, solve a very tough math puzzle and then it, it goes gets written out to the chain that's a very non-green approach there's a lot of electricity that's used to do that and mm -hmm. the, the uh the time it takes to burn a new block is uh, over 10 minutes you start mm -hmm. looking at a couple other new, newer technologies called proof of stake 
uh, and there's uh, different types. And, and that means you're just simply using by stake as you have a certain amount of uh, cryptocurrency in, in, the, in the blockchain. And then you are uh, able to vote on the, on the next block that gets done. And so there are different types. There's delegated proof of stake, which is where you have someone that is um, uh, delegated ahead of time to to kind of uh, be a delegate in this in this whole process. Uh, there is a problem with that in that they are known ahead of time, so there's possible denial of service attacks in that partic particular scenario. The second one is a bonded proof of stake. Uh, this is where someone puts up a certain amount of money and and, and to, to be a good player on the blockchain. Uh, but there are problems with that too. If you even if you put up like a million dollars, but you stand to uh, you know make a trillion by by being a bad actor, uh, that's not a good solution either. Uh, then you get a pure pure proof of stake, uh, which is a no denial of service attacks. And you know, and why blockchain? And to get into that part of the question is every day right now. It pretty, seems like we're pretty much hearing about ransomware attacks or cyber attacks, and these are all done through. Um, on, on centralized uh, data stores so someone's going to lock in a key and that they figure it out and then they they hold the, the data center ransom and uh, this is uh, something that is something we we want to try to do uh you know correct and, and and there's a way to do that and blockchain is a great solution uh to do that with um you know there's two couple types there's public and open and uh private and closed so basically a public blockchain is a also referred to as a permissionless blockchain and on the other hand, a private blockchain is a permissioned blockchain. That would be something like Hyperledger, for example, with IBM. You have authentication you got to use to use the blockchain. It's not open to anybody that just wants to use it. Okay. Whereas, you know, most blockchains today, you know, like, uh, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, and, and now Algorand is referred to as what is a permissionless blockchain platform. I mean, they really strive by design to increase and protect the users and an enemy. And basically, you can always use these public platforms to build a permission solution. You just need to be aware it's upon you and your architects and your developers to create a permissioning model that all starts with some kind of identity management system. So what kind of apps you can you build? Really can build any kind of app, you know, blockchain, as far as that goes, because you, you have that capability. Is, is so what the are some common there. types of apps that, you, that people use the blockchain to build? Well, there's a lot of different ones. Uh, you can uh, go into um, uh, DeFi is probably the biggest one, which is uh, decentralized finance. Um, okay. Things like uh, Circle, Yieldly, Tiny Man are examples of these. But what it is is basically uh, traditionally uh, banks have had all the financial tools. And so when you go into a bank and you want to put together whatever, they've got all the tools in the bank and they're not really publicly available. Now they by have having a big advantage over me, the customer or the the borrower, mm -hmm. the, exactly. The, and now they, all they bets are off because it's it's public and open, Dave. You know, so now uh, anyone can use these tools that are out there, and this is what people are finding. And a lot of the millennials, in particular, are, are really gravitating to investing in crypto and you know pooling, you know. Um, uh, going in liquidity pools and creating those and, you know, the same kind of concepts we've used before, you know, in traditional, like maybe in a stock market where you put together a portfolio of different kinds of stocks, ones that maybe are a little more risky, ones that are a little bit more stable, same kind of thought process here when it goes to liquidity pooling. So DeFi is probably the very biggest uh, vertical market in terms of the type of solutions that you can build, but it's okay. not all about finances. Uh, I want to be clear about that. Hmm. Uh, other examples would be, for example, copyrights. You can put copyrights onto a blockchain. They're immutable and they're global. You know, it's no boundaries on that. You know, and those are done through what's called an NFT or non fungible token. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. And uh, so that's another good example right there. What is that? So is that a legally binding copyright if I put it into a blockchain as opposed to regi registering it somewhere with uh, however it is that traditionally copyrights are? Well, I mean, traditionally, it's, it's uh, within borders, right? You do a copyright, and it's within a border, within a country. And now that this uh, particular data store is global, right, everybody can get at it. So now you have a global copyright. 
Now, uh, there are companies, the Italian Society of Authors and Publishers, for example, CIA, uh, SIAE, uh, they published thousands of uh, copyrights out to uh, the blockchain uh, recently. So this is really going to be the new way to do copyrights. You know, it, it'd be one done in one fell swoop. Also, you got charity organizations, you know, uh, you know, when um, there was a tsunami, I think, uh, over toward uh, China uh years ago uh the red cross got involved to help out but it, it, it lacked in uh tracking where the donations were coming from and where mm -hmm. they were going to so there really wasn't that transparency there and so that was an issue and now by using something like blockchain the audits are built right in voting another example tamper proof healthcare having you know your global re your records available globally no matter where you go every time you go to a new doctor you got to spend a half hour giving your background why not just be in control of your own data is really the the theme here right with blockchain it's your your data right it's your your stuff so you should be in control of that uh the automotive industry industry is coming around they're putting sensors in the cars that are going right out to show the wear and tear out on um you know um uh, into the blockchain so a lot of good uh, potential uh you know applications there very cool uh, you mentioned non-fungible tokens what is that NFTs, yeah. There was actually a skit on Saturday Night Live a couple months ago that said, what oh, the heck is I, I missed NFT? it. I, don't, I can't oh, stay yeah. up that late anymore. You know, we hit the mainstream, you know, when they start talking about <laughs> NFTs on Saturday Night Live, right? And, uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it, let's let's talk about tokens, period, right? So, um, you know, what, what and what type of record types actually are in a distributed ledger? First, you have the blocks we, we talked about. We talked about the blocks, yeah. Time. And we have transactions that occur within a block. Okay. And then the transactions are between what? Between a sender and a receiver or accounts, in other words. I right. See. So uh, you have many accounts that might be associated with uh, uh, one to many there with the transactions Got and it. accounts. So if, you're, if, if I'm sending you money, then you and I are each accounts that participate in a transaction. And that transaction is part of a block. Exactly right. And applications uh, belong to accounts, which are actually smart contracts, and then assets are part of uh, accounts as well. And those would be fungible or non-fungible tokens are, are oh, okay. the assets. Okay. So the fu fungible examples are, are like coins, anything that has the same exact value over and over. So for example, the cryptocurrency for our brand is Algo. Uh, Algos is the, uh, the, the native currency, and every Algo is worth the same amount. You know, whether it's a dollar to whatever it's going for, right? Uh, it's worth loyalty the same points. at a given point in time. I mean, it might be worth more right. or less tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, at a given point in time. That's correct. Uh, and cryptocurrencies all fall into that example. Uh, so basically, think of it as, uh, you know, money that you got in your wallet, right? And, and you know, a dollar is a dollar, no matter where you go at, right. at that point in time. So the, whereas NFT, these are unique. These are like, almost like you could think of these like collectibles. Like, okay. remember, uh, did you ever collect baseball cards, Dave? I did. Back in the day. <laughs> I think years. we all did, right? And, you know, the thing about that was, okay. You collect CDs, I see, by the way. Uh, yeah, yeah. I got <laughs> over 2,000 behind me there. And I'm telling you, you know, with the uh, NFTs and, and, and uh, uh, using these for uh, things like uh, real estate, for example, or, or collectibles, you know, every collectible's got, got metadata around it, right? Is it mint? Is it is it is it creased is it marred is it you know whatever and there's a lot of different things that go into the value of a collectible how rare it is that sort of thing so uh that is an example of an nft another example might be real estate where i've got like a two-bedroom condo here that's worth so much and i go into another side of town there's a pretty similar two-bedroom condo but it's worth different amounts because it's in a different geo yeah, and so the beach for example yeah, so that's really the the idea behind NFTs is you have one of them, and this has become really big for the music industry and for the art industry. Uh, so any anybody that creates, for example, an artistic piece, they can, you know, get a digital image of it, and uh, now you can track ownership. You can buy that, and it's yours, wow. and then you could resell it later on for more. Mm -hmm. So you can look at maybe as an investment for just like you do when you, you know, collect baseball cards, you know, you're collecting it and hopefully they're going to go up. The thing that's nice about it is 
you can trade them, right? And, and whereas if you had like a nice painting on your wall that's a collector's item, there's not much you can do with it other than look at it, maybe take an ad out in a paper or something to sell it and all that. Good. That whole process is a lot easier with NFTs and blockchain because it's all automated. You can do it all through blockchain. I see. That and all the, all the, all the uh, tokens, the, the, the assets that are non-fungible tokens, they are digital tokens. They wouldn't, they would not be a picture on the wall, for example. They would be a, a digital image of that picture. That it'd correct? be a digital image and it'd be stored on like a, a distributed storage system like IPFS, okay. for example. And the okay. transaction would point to that digital asset in that location. So that's how it would work. Same thing with music. Right? You have like a MP3 file, right? That, right. that would be posted up there and, and musicians could, uh, you know, claim it. You know, like, this is mine right here. And then that solves the problem, right? So more people that use it, they would get royalties, right, for for that. And, and, and you it. can expand this thought process to things like maybe uh, industrial engineering, you know, maybe I've got a, a certain way to do the things. I got a patent on this. And, but if you use my patent and incorporate or add to it, then you got to pay me a royalty for it. Right. So there's a whole new kind of ball game opening up here uh, with, by doing things like that on the blockchain. It's pretty by exciting. Way, by the way, I've got a question from the chat here. Moneta, Moneta wants to know what determines the uniqueness of an NFT? Is there a unique ID associated with it, for example? Uh, there is a unique ID. Yeah, there's an, in our blockchain, there's a unique, ID, a unique ID, ID number. That is the only thing. The unit name, the asset uh, description, those could be identical, right. uh, but the actual asset ID is the number, and that's what you would look, look to, uh, to utilize. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think there are a lot of developers, a lot of software developers listening to this. Can you tell me about the process of building applications? Are there particular languages that you need to use? <laughs> Yeah, well, that's a great question. I know uh, anytime I develop any project, the first thing uh, and new technology, the first thing I look for are SDKs, <laughs> right? Give me an SDK that works with this particular blockchain. Uh, also, I, as a developer, I always look for REST APIs, right? Being able to call uh, transactions against that block blockchain through a REST API. And, um, and naturally, I'd love to do this in the language that, that I know. Uh, and so those are the things I would look for for any blockchain that you are developing, as well as the developer portal, uh, which would you know typically give you all these great examples on how to utilize and access that particular blockchain. I can speak for Algorand, uh, for example, uh, the programming languages there that are supported are Java, Go, Python, and JavaScript by Algorand. However, the ecosystem is alive and well, uh, and there are more SDKs, including uh, yours and my favorite, C Sharp. Um, is it there? Uh, yeah, yeah, we got a C. You know, and that's attracted a lot of developers to Algorand just because we have a C Sharp SDK. And, uh, you know, you got the .NET uh, SDK with the C Sharp, Dart, PHP, Rust, Swift, uh, IoT, Unity. Those are all available. So, oh, wow. uh, so those other are, languages. SDKs exist for all those languages. And then is there also a REST API uh, to call? Exactly. Yep. I, REST, I, I assume REST those API. SDKs are, are just calling the REST API under the hood. Which and, and more. The, and more. Right. Okay. And, which means that if there yeah. is no, uh, if, if a particular language doesn't have an SDK, you can always just call that REST API because just virtually every language, every operating system can send a post to an HTTP endpoint assuming that you have internet access yes and no um so not all of the of the calls are exposed to the rest api anything uh -huh. that's involved with the private key is done okay. in the sdk only because oh. uh, you don't want a private key going over the wire in any rest api calls. so Fair from point. a secure standpoint those are you really need an sdk to be able to uh to do build what's called the layer two solution layer one's like right in the blockchain that's the stuff we covered up front with transactions accounts and and assets and and, and applications and and uh, other, other like there's a Solidity as a language for Ethereum that you can use. Uh, and then also there is a um, another uh, solution that can be used uh, to build smart contracts, and that's Reach. And that's like a JavaScript-like language. I could talk more about that in a little bit as well. Uh, we have another question from the chat. I'll mispronounce this person's name, but I'll call them Mawosa. <laughs> wants to know, do you think NFTs will be able to hold up in court in relation to legal ownership of things like copyright and assets and property? Well, I guess it all depends on the um, the, the quality of, of, of determining 
you know, this is my NFT. Like, like you do with the all those copyrights I talked about. Those are all NFTs. So they go through some scrutiny, right, with the with the company that is put, putting those up. And they have to provide evidence. Anybody that wants to create these copyrights has to provide evidence, just like you went to a copyright office, okay. that this is my, my code. This is my, you know, uh, this is all mine, right? And you would have to go through that same kind of process in that scenario. And I imagine it would be a similar process uh, other ways, you, you know, and He's got a good point because when you do something like that with um, well, really anything, uh, you, you've got to be able to be fairly certain that that is uh, a legit. You know, uh, naturally, when you have these high rollers or, or people that are, are very famous and they have an NFT, you know, it, it's pretty reliable because they're 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 tweeting it and they're you know whatever talking about it so um uh, and that might be another way to do some cross uh links on the authentic right. authenticity you know, things that's a like fair that. answer from uh we're not lawyers here so just as a, as a yeah yeah that, that, sounds, uh, that sounds, yeah. sounds reasonable um <laughs> uh, we were we've got about nine minutes left here i want to have like a few more questions here uh uh smart contracts and d apps i've heard of those what are those yeah, DAPS is actually the, the way to say it. It's a distributed application. So that's okay. And so what you have is basically an application that resides on the blockchain in a distributed manner. And, um, you know, I, I want to back up one step here, okay, okay. Um, on signing transactions. In other words, um, how does something get authenticated and signed onto the blockchain? Well, there's three types of accounts. You have an individual account. Say you got an account, I got an account. I've got the private key to my account. You got the private key to your account. Every account has two keys, a public key, which is okay to give out because that's how you're going to give money. You know, mm -hmm. people are going to send you algos to your public account. The private one, you always want to keep in a wallet of some sort, like a, a Algorand wallet or um, uh, my algo or any other wallet that might be for that particular uh, crypto. And, uh, or just uh, write down your, your, your passphrase which is your private key on a piece of paper and keep it in your, your safety box. That's another, you know, yeah, have, tried and true. I have my post-it note right on my monitor. Here. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> post-it notes are good. I don't know if that'll cut it, Dave, but, <laughs> uh, and then another type of, so that's accounts, right? So another uh, type of account is called a multi-signature sign signing. Multi-signature is used for like a group of people. Say you're on a board of directors, you want at least five people to approve this particular transaction. So the, you create a multi, it's like going to a bank and have, have multiple signatures on a check to cash it. Same type of thing where you define what the threshold is. If you're above that threshold and any five out of the 10 people or whatever uh, agree to it, then it'll get signed by that multi-sig group. The last one is this, a logic a signature. And these are smart contracts. Either the program returns true and it's going to sign it or it returns false and it's not going to mm -hmm. sign it. That's what smart contracts are all about. Coming back old school, Dave, true or false. That's it. Plain and simple. And so um, that uh, components of the smart contract are the accounts like we talked about uh, that are doing the to and from. But th those would be called through a logic program or code. And uh, then you're going to have uh, the ability to call the application through a layer two solution and then execute in a virtual environment or um, a VM uh, on the blockchain itself. There's got to be some horsepower there to be able to execute uh, this, this, these contracts. And so th that is kind of like the quick view of it in Algorand that's called the AVM for the Algorand virtual machine for Ethereum. It'd be like the EVM for the uh, ETH Ethereum uh, virtual machine. And that's really how it goes. And, um, uh, on the Algorand uh, blockchain, it, we have uh, bytecode, uh, very similar to the old assembler days, Dave, where you have uh, push and pop on the stack, and, and, mm -hmm. and it's in a language called Teal, Transaction mm -hmm. Execution Approval Language. But there are also other solutions out there. One of them is called Reach, which is a blockchain agnostic tool. So with the same set of code, you can deploy to both Algorand and Ethereum and whatever blockchains they, they support down the road that sounds, that sounds with the same set of code. Yeah. yeah, it's very analogous to like uh, with Xamarin, right? You can use the same code, uh, set of code with Xamarin and deploy to iOS, to Android, to Windows. And right. now you have the same capability with a tool like Reach, which has uh, two components. It's got a front end and a back end. And the back end is uh, basically all the reach code that 
ends up generating the teal or generating the Ethereum uh, code to use in the solution. And the front end can be any language through a remote procedure call uh, with JavaScript, Go, C Sharp, um, you know, Python, to name a few. And uh, so Reach is actually not a, a Algorand uh, company. They're a partner of ours. They're, they're their right. own company growing leaps and bounds. So that's a really great thing to think about, uh, you know, going forward. And, you know, the, the idea here is you don't want a horror story. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you about it. There's, tr- there's a lot of trust involved in this because it's a new technology or new to most of us. You know, what, what yeah. are the things that can go yeah. wrong? Well, you know, we've learned, you know, Bitcoin is what, over 10 years old. It's an old technology. And I guess um, it's not that new, but it's new to a lot of people. It, it is new to a lot of people, but uh, it was one of the originals, right? And since then, um, there's a lot uh, snappier and greener and better, you know, uh, modern blockchains. I'll, I'll put it, leave it like that. Okay. And, you know, what you want is uh, to avoid the scenario where you would lock away any kind of cryptocurrency that you can never get at again. I'll give you an example. Let's say the smart contract creates an account and then it gets funded through an escrow escrow from an escrow account into that. Uh, say they, they put in a thousand, whatever algos. And then uh, the contract gets done. And, but that account st- still has like maybe a 500 algo balance. Well, you don't want that. You want it to be a zero balance when you get anything in should be used up and that's it. Because remember I told you about the public and private key, the private key is in the smart contract. You can't get at it after the, 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 the contract is done and executed. So these are the types of things that you want to watch out for is leaving this uh, crypto on the table in a, uh, in, in a smart contract. And Fortunately, there are tools like Reach, for example, that do this kind of verification for you and all these mathematical proofs, and it really is a, a good way to go. Other than that, if you were to write your own smart contract in any other language, you would need to really hire an auditor to really audit that uh, that smart contract and uh, make sure there's no holes like like there were in, in our history uh, of uh, blockchain to avoid that scenario. All right, Russ, we've got about uh, two or three minutes left here. Uh, I know people want to know uh, where to get started. They're, they're excited to get moving on. Where do they go? Let's, yeah, I'm going to drop uh, a link. Let's, let's use your uh, company as an example, Algorand. Okay. You something on your blockchain. Yeah, that'd be great. So I'm just going to go ahead and plug into the chat here uh, a site. And anybody that's brand new to um, working with um, – Algorand, the developer. Developer.algorand.com. I'm clicking on it now. Yeah, or actually it's dot org, but it'll it'll. Oh, I'm sorry, dot org. My bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you I, know, I, com I worked wrong. But yeah, it, it did. It redirects. Yeah, <laughs> they figured that one out. And uh, but yeah, that that's where we got. Uh, if you scroll down the page, you can see all the REST APIs, the development tools, uh, all the IDs, and and really a thriving uh, community. We also have a a Discord. Uh, channel two, which is really uh, very, very good, very important, um, and I think this is uh, uh, something else we can uh, I could send you to here. El Grand, make people and copy this here. So I'll put this in here. So this I like to use for developers that are getting started and they got questions about what they're doing. This is a great support mechanism, Dave, is what it is by the community. And there's a lot of people in the community helping out, answer questions and, and really building, um, you know, solutions with, uh, with Al Grant. That's very cool. And uh, I want to give a shout out to our team out in uh, Denver. Uh, we're actually doing this as an ancillary event to uh, East Denver. And a good amount of the staff is over there. They're about to start uh, in a minute on the next session uh, that they're going to do live over there and some good workshops and, and uh, hackathons going out there, Dave. It's been a real pleasure. It has uh, been. We've got like 30 yeah. seconds left, and this has been fantastic. I've learned a lot. I hope the folks that are the, the listening have learned a lot. And uh, we're going to be um, – it's, it's, it's wonderful to see you again, my friend. If people want to yeah. watch this, we'll have it up on technologyandfriends.com within a few weeks. And it'll also, um, I think the, the, the conference is also recording it as well. Thanks a lot, man. Thank you, sir. All right. Take care. Bye, everybody. <laughs>
Hello, my name is Russ Festino. Two things I'm very excited about. One is technology. It really is amazing how technology has uh, progressed over the years and to be able to witness that firsthand, uh, you know, how things have evolved has just been amazing. And um, I know when I left school, I was happy, you know, I'm done with my education out of college, you know, and guess what? You keep having to learn uh, no matter what you do. And the second thing is friends. Friends um, are great. You know, when it's all said and done, you'd be remembered for three things, friends, family, and community. And uh, so friends is a big part of that. And um, I think uh, it goes a long way uh, when you got some good friends and you can't have enough good friends uh, in this day and age. So anyway, been a pleasure um, being on technology and friends and uh, look forward to the next podcast. Take care.